I get started the broadcasting. Mm -hmm. Okay. I get started the broadcasting. Okay, welcome, Shashi Skupta. Welcome. Can you hear me? Oh, nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. Shashi. Yeah, thank you for coming. Oh, there are some Hi. audience too. Yeah. Shashi. Okay. Shashi. Do you wanna I'll test your video and audio is then sharing the your screen? Yeah, can I share the screen? Yep. Are you yep. able to see it? It works well. Nice picture. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You're the first presenter, so she is? Yeah. 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 Wait for a while and end your turn. You turn on your videos and a, a microphone. Yes. Until your turn, yes. you need to unmute your microphone and videos, please. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And stop sharing, please. And oh, we nice. have, yeah, another one. Hi, Alberto. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Good to see nice you. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we have some time. Would you mind uh, practicing sharing your screen? Alberto? Me? Ah, yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. 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 yeah, let's check it. So give me one second. Share a screen. Yes, I'm going to check everybody's screens learning on the app. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, can you see it? Yes. Yeah, presentation mode. Let me check one more thing. Can you see now the like the general view of? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Presentation. PowerPoint. Yeah. Full. Yeah, it works well. Yeah, full screen. Right? Great. And okay. Great. And a video and clear too. And Alberto, you are the second presentation. Presenter. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Until your presentation, please mute your microphone and videos. Yes. Okay. And, and your turn, turn on that, please. You know you are. Yeah. And ah, uh, my site blurs. Uh, we need. Yeah, Pikram, are you in there? Um, hi, yes, I am. Hi, nice to meet you. Let nice me show meeting. you a video, please. Um, you want to, um, you want me to share my video? Yep. Um, sure. Um, just give me a minute. Um, blah, blah, blah. So just to confirm my understanding that now that I'm yeah. here, I don't need to be anywhere else. Yeah. Yes. I can see Sounds you. Yeah. And do you want to share? Or practice or sharing your screen? Uh, sure, I can do that. Yeah. Um, hmm. Oh, looks like oh, looks like I've changed my settings. Okay. Hmm. Sometimes it doesn't work well. Right. We don't know why, but sometimes. You can see my screen. It's your yeah, empty window. Okay. I can see your file. Yeah, it works well. Great. That's good. Okay. Yeah, thanks. You are the 
Okay, third presenter. Okay. Yep, sounds good. Please unmute the video and microphone until your turn and end your turn. You turn them on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's. We have to wait. Uh, all judges to come. <laughs> we have 13 judges in this session, but I can see only. Uh, yeah, they all judges. Yeah, five judges. We need eight more, yeah. so wait for one, please. Okay, thank you. Have your time. And I will share my screen. Hello, yes, hello. Mm. Uh, Jumbin, just one question. Can we share this Zoom link with colleagues or is it only for participants and judges? What links do you mean? Yeah, this, this Zoom link. Yeah, this, this room. Can we share it with uh, your sure. yeah. colleagues or? This link. Yeah. Yes. Where is this link? Uh, I opened too many. Yeah. Too many. Yeah. I know, okay, don't worry. I see he already joined in. Yeah. I guess he found uh, the way in. Really? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, we can enter the session, live sessions from the uh, Claudia app. And I ah, okay, great. On the slide two. Oops, oops. Yeah. Thank you. Oops, I'm so busy to do many things alone. <laughs> I need to check. Ah, oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We have almost all yeah, messages. We have to wait for a moment. Anyway, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jun Bam, and I am working for Gangbum University, Seoul, in Korea. It is summer, very hot summer outside. Uh, it is impossible to go outside. And I am Andrew 
figure from Microsoft Research uh, running this ACM student research competition uh, I ex this year. And this is a technical presentation uh, round. It will get started in another few minutes because I'm waiting for more judges to come. Uh, we have 13 judges today. I think almost all come. And let's wait for a minute and please hang tight. Okay, we have 11 judges now. We can get started. Okay, uh, I'm going to get started. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining us at the ACM Student Research Competition, uh, Research Competitions Technical Presentation Round. This is the second round uh, of the competition that started out with 18 contestants. These are graduate and undergraduate students in various universities across the world. The first, they presented a short paper yeah, about their works and evaluated by PC members almost six months ago. And among them, only 18 contestants yeah, were approved for this conference. They are the 18. And yesterday, we had three virtual poster sessions, very interesting sessions. and. We also selected nine contestants among 18 and across different time bands for technical presentation sessions like this one. We have another two one Pacific and interacting bands. Uh, among five, nine selected contestants, five are graduate students and four are in the undergraduate category. So this session has four contestants like this one. And you can see the list now. And we also have invited uh, 13 judges like this one. Yeah, thank you very much for your support, the judges. They are all here as an audience. Yeah, okay, let me briefly inform you about some guidelines for contestants. Here's this, these ones. Uh, when it's your turn, contestants, please share your screen and unmute your microphone and videos and then make a 10 minute presentation. It's a little bit strict, 10 minutes. And then we will have a three minute Q&A times. It's a little strict too. Yeah. So just will type their questions into the uh, chat, text chat windows and I will read them loud at once. And then you contest and answer the question. That's all, it's simple. And judges, uh, please ask questions in the text chat windows during the talks and also evaluate all presentations with the scores in your head. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, that's all. And yeah, simple guidelines. So I stop showing my screen and let's get started to the first presenter. Mm. I'd like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Shashis Gupta, yeah, this guy. He's an undergraduate student of IIT Mumbai, and the title of the presentation is Machine Translation Testing via Pathological Invariance. Oh, look difficult. Yeah, could you start your presentation? Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Shashis Gupta, and I'm here to present my work on Machine Translation Testing by Pathological Invariance. Let me give you a brief overview of what I did. 
I created a tool called Pine for validating machine translation software. The basic intuition behind Pine is that sentences with different meaning should not have the same translation. So basically, what I am doing is that generating sentences with different meaning and checking if they have the same translation or not. If they don't have the same translation, if they do have the same translation, then they are translation errors. So now this pair of sentences with different meaning can be of two type. On the left hand side. I have a pair. He's a good cricket player. He goes to the market. These two sentences are completely different, and it is very unlikely that they would be having a same transition. Whereas, consider the pair on the right hand side. He's a good cricket player. He's a good basketball player. They are the sentences which are syntactically similar, and there is some chance that they may have same transition for some translator. Hence, we are generating sentences with sim. Uh, Similar syntactically similar sentences, and try to get the go, get those sentences which have the same translation. So why I'm doing this? We in our daily life use translation system, and we also encounter some translation errors. For example, this is a real life translation error in Google Translate. If you enter this sentence for English to Hindi, I had a story to tell, and I wanted to finish it. Draper says. but we get the translation in hindi is that i had a story to tell and i wanted to finish it hence the phrase tripper says goes missing in the translation there are some other translation errors which has also led to several problems such as a palestinian man posted good morning in arabic on facebook which was translated to attack them and he got arrested by police due to this so it becomes really important to test such translation system so now let me give you the overview of pine but it does we have a sentence we first generate syntactically similar sentences after that we filter by syntactic and semantic information those sentences which have the similar meaning as the original sentence or are syntactically or semantically wrong after that we feed these filter sentences into the model under test for some translation language setting and we get target sentences after that we detect translation errors by comparing the tra translation of the original sentence with the generated sentence so coming to the first step generate syntactically similar sentences here we are using but we perturb each noun verb etc in the sentence except the analytic stop words because they were generating a lot of syntactically incorrect sentences and ask but for 50 suggestions and generate new sentences the second step is filtering by syntactic and semantic information so it is done in three steps filtering out synonyms filtering by consonant structure and filtering by sentence embeddings the first step is filtering out synonyms so here we are using words api which is a paid api to check for synonyms and we check if they uh, the suggested word is has a is a synonym of the original word and if it, it do then we filter out that case the second filtering step is filtering by consonant structure here we check the, that if the consonant structure of the generated sentence and the original sentence is similar or not if it is not similar then it is highly likely that the generated sentence is syntactically incorrect for example consider the case they are doing something completely different they are doing something around different here these two have different consonant structure and the second sentence is in fact syntactically wrong the third step of filtering is filtering by sentence embeddings this step is kind of optional here we use universal sentence encoder to get embeddings of the generated and the original sentences and then we take the cosine distance between these embeddings to get the similarity between the sentences and we set a threshold and if the similarity is greater than the threshold we filter out that sentence and by varying the threshold we get different precision recall results which have been discussed later the third step is collecting target sentences so here we evaluate google translate and we use three translation settings english to chinese english to hindi and english to german the last step of pine is detecting translation errors we compare the translation of the generated sentence with the original sentence if they are same 
fine we will report them as suspicious pair now after the suspicious pair we manually select the pathological invariants from them the condition for pathological invariant is that both the sentences should be syntactically and lexically correct sentences should have the different meaning and at least one of them should contain translation errors these are the results we are able to get using pine we are able to achieve decent enough precision and f1 score for all the three language settings this is a precision versus recall trade off curve we can see that as we increase the threshold recall increases and precision fall down also we can see that we can even achieve 100% precision but recall will be a bit smaller this is these are some of the examples of error detected by pine here in the first case something is uh, replaced by anything and they do have the different meaning but the same translation and has their translation errors the second case also second case also they do not know what to do with him they do not hear what to do with him they have different meaning but same translations these are examples of false negative generated by pine in the first case took is replaced by treated and it doesn't change the meaning of the sentence and hence they are marked as false positive the second case started is replaced by seemed which makes the sent second sentence syntactically wrong and hence we mark them as false positive the third case is false negatives these two sentences in which first Uh, show is replaced by think and these two sentences have the different meaning but they have a high similarity according to universal sentence encoder and hence they are marked as false negative we were able to improve the result a lot by using thesaurus dictionary along with words api we scrap the web and get synonyms of words using thesaurus and we were able to improve the f1 score by 0.1 and it is a very big achievement it was able to beat state of the art methods in half of the data sets half of the settings these are some of the more errors found by pine okay yeah 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 thanks I just read the questions. Okay, we have two questions. Yeah, let me read them. And the first one, what does precision and recall mean in this setting? Are you measuring the goodness of good Google yeah. translators or testing? Yeah, of course. Okay, so precision is the number of pathological invariants upon total number of suspicious pairs. And recall is the number of pathological invariants after the threshold upon total number of pathological invariants okay <laughs> and while we ask it are all steps fully automated yeah all the steps are fully automated except the la last one where we manually select the pathological invariants yeah uh, another one how do you ensure that the translation do not contain the same meaning uh, only by checking the syntax Yes, but I didn't get the question. Yeah, yeah. this question is on the Q and A window. Uh, I cannot see this question. Can you again speak it? Yes. Are uh, um, how do you ensure that the translation do not convey the same meaning? Oh. Translation do not compare the same meaning. Yeah, only by checking the syntax. No, we just, yes, uh, the we filter out those cases, and after that, if uh, there are cases where the translation have the like the both the sentences have the same meaning, we manually check them and select the pathological invariants. Okay. Oh, uh, we have some time. Hey, one more questions. As for BART, BRT, did you leverage the pre-trained language model or you performed the fine-tuning? 
No, we use the pre-trained language model. It used to be the state of the art when we started our work, and hence we used the BERT. Okay. Okay. One more question. The last one. You answered too many questions. <laughs> so it's as oh, many questions. You compared Google and Bing or statistical uh, machine translation systems. Why not compare with also a rule-based MT system? What is a rule-based MT system? I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure to what it is. Uh, natural language processing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, never mind. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Shashis. Thank you for your talk. Okay. Yes. Okay, I can turn off this. Okay. Let's proceed to the yeah. next speaker, I uh, Alberto Martin Lopez. Yeah. Uh, a graduate student of the University of Seville. Spain. Yeah. The title is yeah, Automated Analysis of Interparameter Dependencies Web APIs. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so just yeah. one second. Are you seeing the screen like full screen and you hear me everything okay? Yeah, I can see it full screen. Let's get okay. Yeah. yeah, let's get it started. So, well, well, uh, yeah, my name is Alberto Martin. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Seville, and today I'll be talking about automated analysis of interparameter dependencies in web APIs. So, well, right now you may be asking yourself, okay, but what's an interparameter dependency and why is it a problem? So, here you have an example. This comes from the YouTube web API where you have an operation to search for videos, for example, and you can filter those videos by their duration with the video duration parameter. But the thing is that if you specify a value for that parameter, you must also set the type parameters value to video. So that's an interparameter dependency, a constraint, a restriction between two or more input parameters of the same web API operation. So here you have another example. This comes from PayPal. And this is actually an interparameter dependency happening between two different properties of the same JSON object. And this can get as complex as you may imagine. So for example, this comes from the Foursquare Web API, where you have an interparameter dependency involving five input parameters. So well, why is this really a problem? Well, mainly because these dependencies are not supported by current Web API specification languages like RAML or even the Open API specification, which could be considered the industry standard. So in this last case, they even tell you that they explicitly do not support these dependencies. So what you can do instead is just document this dependency in natural language in the documentation, but then it's ambiguous and sometimes difficult to understand, not to mention that this lack of support can mean a strong limitation for automating certain things like code generation or testing. So also what they propose is, okay, when you violate some dependency, when you make an invalid request, just return an error response, like a 400 status code, explaining what went wrong. And that's actually what YouTube does. When you make an invalid request, you just get a 400 status code, client error, saying that you're using incompatible parameters. But here's the thing. Community has shown great interest in this issue as reflected in a feature request from the GitHub repository of the Open API specification. So this issue is still open after quite a long time. It's very active because it has received more than 50 comments on almost 300 positive votes. So this suggests that industry practitioners, practitioners in general are quite interested in this feature. Okay, so what's our contribution here? Well, mainly three things. So first thing, we reviewed the set of industrial APIs just to see if this is common or not, if this is a common problem that, that, that occurs too much or not really. Second thing, we created a domain specific language so that we could formally specify all the dependencies that we found in practice. And third, we also proposed an approach to automatically analyze these dependencies by transforming them into a constraint satisfaction problem. But well, first things first. First contribution, we reviewed a set of 40 industrial APIs used by millions of users worldwide. So in total, 2,600 web API operations, and we found more than 600 dependencies. So this confirmed our initial thought. Actually, four out of every five web APIs contain interparameter dependencies. So they're extremely common and pervasive. 
But the best of all is that we managed to classify all these dependencies into seven patterns, those that, that you see there. So for example, the requires pattern means that if you use some parameter, then it requires you to use another parameter, like in the YouTube example that I showed you before, that's a requires pattern. So this contribution was published last year at the International Conference on Service-Oriented Computing. Second contribution, the domain-specific language, which we called Interparameter Dependency Language, IDL. So with this DSL, you can succinctly specify all the seven patterns of dependencies that we consistently found in practice. I think the syntax, the syntax is mostly self-explanatory. And again, the best of all is that we also created an open API as extension so that you could include all these dependencies inside an open API specification document. So you remember this issue that I was referring to before? Well, we hope that this is really a first step towards closing that issue. Let's hope so in some time. <laughs> and finally, regarding the third contribution, we also proposed an approach to automatically analyze these dependencies. So we developed a tool called Ideal Reasoner, which takes as input the API specification, for example, the open API, and the dependencies expressed in Ideal language and automatically transform them into a constraint satisfaction problem using a language like Minasync, which is a constraint model language. So this is where I received most help from my advisors because from my advisors, because they are experts in constraint programming. And this allowed us to devise a number of analysis operations like those that you see here. So these are 10 analysis operations, but more are possible and they are quite useful. So for example, the get valid request allows you to automatically generate a valid request for the web API. So a request that satisfies all the interparameter dependencies present in the web API operation. So this contribution together with the domain specific language and a few other things were sent to the Transactions and Services Computing Journal and it's currently under review. Well, regarding the applications, we strongly believe that this approach and ideal reasoner specifically has lots of potential, but we focus on the context of RESTful API testing as that's what my PhD is about. So basically, basically thanks to Ideal Reasoner, we proposed a novel constraint-based testing approach for REST APIs, and we compared it with random testing. So by random testing, I mean just, I mean just randomly generating requests, so without managing the interparameter dependencies. We performed a number of experiments. For example, for the YouTube API, we wanted to see if we were able to generate the valid requests with random testing. And basically, as the YouTube web API contains a large number of dependencies, 18 in total, it's very unlikely that you will automatically satisfy all of them. So basically, if you try random testing, you hit the wall. It's like hitting a wall, you just get 1.6% of valid requests because very probably you will violate at least one dependency of the API. So in contrast with constraint-based testing, all requests are valid because all of them satisfy the interparameter dependencies of the API operation. Second experiment we performed with the Stripe API. This experiment, we basically wanted to check how long it takes until we execute 1000 valid requests. So again, with random testing, as you're generating requests, you're also generating tons of invalid requests. That's why it took us more than 73,000 total generated requests just to get 1,000 valid requests. And that took us more than 10 hours. So in contrast with constraint-based testing, again, roughly 11 minutes, because we only had to generate 1,000 requests. All of them were valid. And finally, thanks to this approach, we also wanted to see if we were able to uncover a number of bugs and conformance errors. And again, there was a difference. So with random testing, we found bugs and conformance errors in nine out of, sorry, in five out of nine services. And with constraint-based constraint -based testing approach, it, show, it showed more potential as it uncovered bugs in all the services under test. So this contribution was sent to the International Conference on Service-Oriented Computing this year, and it's currently under review. So regarding future work, I will be doing a number of research studies uh, first one, I will be going to the university, sorry, to Christian, Christiania University College in a few months. I will be working with Professor Andrea Curie, and we'll work on search-based testing of RESTful Web APIs. 
And second research stay, I will be going next year to the University of California, Berkeley for six months, thanks to a Fulbright grant. And we'll be exploring the possibilities regarding ideal reasoner and API gateways. And we'll explore also the possibility of, of deploying our testing framework in a public server and offering it, and offering it as a service to other users or companies that might be, might be interested in, in using it. So I think that would be all, and I will welcome any any question or comment that you have. <laughs> Thanks, Alberto. We have three questions. Uh, the first one is, how is the output of CFP looks like when there is no satisfaction? Can you suggest repairs? Well, that's actually an interesting question. Well, well, basically, when the CSP has no satisfaction, it just returns that there, there's no solution. So what it means is that there, there is no valid request, for example, that you can send to the, to the API. Or, for example, imagine that you're testing whether your API request is valid or not. Imagine it is invalid. So that would make the CSP be non-satisfiable. So for the second question, it's pretty interesting because we're actually working on it. Yeah, we are working on suggesting repairs. There are some CSP solvers that offer a capability of explaining what went wrong. Like for example, find MUS is a CSP solver that offers that explanation capability and we can leverage that. So when you make an invalid request, not only you know that it is invalid, but also you know why it is invalid, thanks to this kind of CSP solvers that offer this explanation capability. Okay, great. The second one is, do you need to manually encode all the interdependencies in IDL? If yes, is there a way to automate that by analyzing API text? So yeah, the first approach would be that the developers themselves encode these dependencies in IDL, but as you can see, the syntax is quite succinct. So I, we strongly think that it's uh, pretty easy to understand. But regarding the second question, uh, absolutely, it would be quite interesting. In fact, in the first contribution that we presented, that review of industrial APIs, we also proposed a set of linguistic patterns that are correlated with the dependency patterns. So by analyzing those linguistic patterns, you could try to automatically infer the kind of dependency that is happening. So based on that, you could actually create an ideal dependency. So yeah, we haven't really delved on that, uh, but it's, uh, it's something that we considered for our first contribution. We analyzed the linguistic patterns used. Okay, great. We have the last one that looks important. How many requests did you generate for the YouTube study? Well, so our study was divided in, let's say two different experiments. So the first experiment we wanted to check how many valid requests we generated. And the second experiment, we wanted to check uh, how many bugs or failures we were able to uncover. So in the first experiment, we generated 1,000 requests. And in the second experiment, we generated 2,000 requests, half of them valid and half of them invalid. So one uh, satisfying the interparameter dependencies and the others violating the interparameter dependencies on purpose. Okay, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Alberto. Thank you. Okay, let's switch to the next presentation. And this is a third presenter. His name is Vikram Zabmarian from University of Waterloo. He's an undergraduate student. The title of his presentation is an empirical study of first time open source contributors on GitHub. It looks like the title a little bit changes anyway. Epigram, please. Um, hello, everyone. Just confirming that all of you can hear me loud and clear. Yep. Fantastic. Um, so let's so let's get started. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Vikram, and I'm here to present my study, which is an empirical study of first-time open source contributors um, on GitHub. Um, so this um, my work sort of started from a personal frustration, really. And Steinmarker sort of um, summarized it beautifully. And he says, finding a task to start with was the most common difficulty faced by first time contributors. And so I was trying to sort of um, learn how to code and sort of learn software engineering and things like that. And I, and I was told that, you know, making contribution to open source projects was, was a good way to learn. Um, and I thought, okay, maybe why not, why not, why don't I mimic um, 
somebody who has done this before? Why don't I study other newcomers and then sort of do what they do? But then when I looked for that data, I sort of really couldn't find it. Um, so then that's where this sort of study comes from. And that's where, um, uh, yeah. So what's our motivation? Our motivation is to uh, better understand contributors of first time, um, to um, better understand contributions by first time contributors by studying the characteristics of pull requests they make to an open source project. Um, this is in order to help other first time contributors to, to point them in the direction they should be uh, looking at in order to contribute open source projects and to help OSS moderators because a project that can attract more developers is more often than not a more successful project and it's in always as and it's always in an OSS moderator's interest to attract more um, more developers. Uh, okay, so there's an empirical study and data is king. Um, and you may be familiar with a lot of pre-curated data sets of GitHub, um, GH Torrent is a very famous one. Um, but then when, when we investigated it, we quickly realized that uh, these data sets wouldn't work because the data was sort of squashed linearly and we had to make queries from queries, from the result of queries and things like that. So we had to get the truth from the source of the, from the lion's mouth. Uh, so we had to use the GitHub API, and a, and a lot of um, and a lot of researchers are sort of apprehensive to use the GitHub API because it's rate limited. So um, so per request, it returns only the top thousand results. Uh, so then we had to make we had to set up a lot of uh, systems to make sure that that didn't introduce a bias. So very briefly, uh, what process did we use? Uh, so then we went to the Apache Software Foundation's GitHub page, and we got. Uh, the 1,000 most popular uh, repositories from there, and then we got um, the top 1,000 contributors to these repositories. 99.9% um, .9 of repositories have less than 1,000 contributors. So essentially, we have all the contributors to the Apache Software Foundation's top 1,000 repositories. Uh, this came to around 15 to 16,000 users, and then we went through each user. So then, if you went to a user's profile on GitHub and looked at the, um, you can find a list of repositories they are publicly publicly affiliated with. Uh, this could be their own projects, or this could be projects they're forked. Uh, we particularly looked at the projects that were forked. We studied the forked repository and the parent of the fork. We checked whether there was a commit in the forked repository, and if it was, whether that same commit existed in um, the parent. Sometimes uh, a developer could be part of an organization and he or she could have access to the repo and does not need to make pull requests, make a contribution. So that is clearly not an open source um, contribution per se. So we had to ensure that a pull request was associated uh, with uh, these commits as well. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, we looked at all the, uh, so then when we do this for all the repositories for a user, we get a big list of open source contributions they've made and we look at the first one. Um, so, now that the, so now that we've done that, what results do we get? 31% um, of all changes were one to five lines long and 18, 19% of changes were 16 to 15 lines long. Um, you can see this graph here, which is, um, and you might be wondering what these four categories are, a little bit more on that um, uh, later in the presentation, but then minor, so then we categorized our commits into four types. We categorized them into minor features, major features, bug fixes and documentation. Um, and most users, and this is a logarithmic scale note, uh, so most users made contributions between 10 to the power zero to 10 to the power two lines, so that's zero to 100 lines, as you can see by these dots. Uh, just a few users uh, made something called a major feature, and only those uh, users had massive line contributions, and uh, this sort of really skewed our data, and it's really right skewed data, but most users contributed in the uh, zero to a hundred lines uh, range. Um, Git as a system sort of tags files changed. Uh, it tags them as modified, created, renamed, and removed. Uh, so then 54% of all files changed were modified. So then users sort of added or deleted lines from other files that pre-existed. 35% um, of the files were created new, 5% uh, were renamed and 4% was, was removed. Um, a large percentage of this 35% came from major features. So major features, the, the average commit in a, uh, that's a major feature involved a lot of boilerplate code and a lot of starting up code, which involved a lot of files and a lot of lines changed. Um, 
We also investigated the languages uh, that these users used, um, and Java is by far the most popular language at 34, uh, at 34%. Um, this observation sort of aligns the fact that Java was the most popular language throughout the 2000s and the early 2010s. And we studied users who made first-time contributions between 2010 to around 2016, 2018, because that's when GitHub was signing up. Um, second, the second most popular language was Python at 5.9%, and the third most popular language was JavaScript at 4%. Uh, something interesting is that a lot of users, around 5% of all contributions, were picture files. So these are non-code contributions. Um, so users uploaded pictures for the purpose of UI, for documentation, and some repositories even had image collections. Um, and something curious is that C++ is incredibly unpopular. It was only the 15th most popular language for first-time contributors, while it was the fourth most popular main language for the OSS repositories we studied. So then GitHub tags each repository with a language. It studies, um, it tag. so then the most used language in that repository is that repo's main language. And C++ was the fourth most popular main language, while C++ was only 15th most popular language with first-time contributors. Um, so that's a quick view at our results. Um, so what are some of the takeaways? So most first-timers take up small to medium-sized tasks, documentation edits, bug fixes, so and so. However, they should not be discouraged to take big tasks as well as the entire fourth quartile had over 75 lines changed. Uh, first time contributors should also look into non code contributions, such as contributing image files. This would be a fantastic way to sort of uh, figure out how the software development process works, how Git works, and how, um, yeah, so you can sort of get yourself into the OSS community without even writing a line of code. Um, and moderators of OSS projects could use that results to prioritize. Um, based on language of the file that needs to be changed. And it's also in a, in a moderator's interest to break up big tasks that are relatively simple into smaller tasks because first timers seem to be, um, seem to prefer smaller tasks. Um, so further work. Um, so then we have this data and there's a lot more information to be uh, gotten out of it. So then we classified the commits we got into a lot of different types. And then we sort of studied them in, in incredible detail and then you can find out more in this link. This paper has been submitted to IEEE software. Um, it's still being reviewed. Um, so just like a quick uh, description, we classified bugs into large categories such as documentation, features, bugs, uh, Git related issues, et cetera. And within these, we categorized them into subtypes. Uh, something interesting, around 13% of all changes that users made were typographic bugs, uh, for instance. That's something which is presented in the in the follow-up paper to this. Um, so yeah, um, so that's that's my research work. Um, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Yeah, thanks. Oh, we have many questions. Okay. Oh, yeah. The previous one, why did you choose, oh, looks very fundamental one. Why did you choose the Apache Software Foundation? Right. Um, so then we needed a big list of users to study. Um, and we could have gotten them from anywhere, but then we wanted to study users who had at least one contribution to a well-known, well-understood, uh, popular open source sort of developer. So, so then the alternative was to sort of maybe pass through GitHub and pick up random users, but then there's no, there no guarantee that these users would have made other first-time contributors or were you know, seasoned developers, for instance. Okay. okay, the second question is, your goal was to understand first-time contribute to open source software projects. So after conducting your project and study, what would be the most important recommendation you would give to a first-time contributor? Um, sure, oh. um, so then um, I'm sort of uh, giving you this answer from my related work as well. Um, so then uh, from my further work, first timers, if they were interested in picking up a new language, Java, uh, JavaScript and Python seem to be the most popular languages right now. Um, and they should look into maybe learning that. Um, they can look into contributing. Um, so if they're really, really new to software uh, development, they could look into contributing non-code contributions, such as image, images, as I said, repositories, 
exist where the main one of the main objectives is to collect images. Uh, um, they could look into that. Typographic bugs were incredibly popular. Um, users, uh, first timers, could sort of look into fixing typographic bugs and things like that. Um, a lot of the uh, um, issues first timers fixed were often tagged as uh, good first time issues. Um, so users should sort of look out for that and try to solve issues tagged like so. Those are just some of the recommendations. Okay, well, we have many questions. So I try to skip oh, complicated questions. <laughs> So number four is Java like first because the Apache Software Foundation main contains Java project. Um no because we okay so we studied users so we so we got a big list of users um, from the Apache Software mm -hmm. Foundation but then the open source contribution these users made was definitely not limited to um, the Apache Software Foundation so then um, these users made contributions to a lot of different repositories. And in fact, users who had their first open source contribution in Apache projects was, was rather minimal. minimal. It was in the low to mid teens, I believe. Yep. OK, let me ask the rest one. Did you know the number of experienced first timer versus novice first timer? Right. Um, so then that is, in fact, uh, one of the uh, shortcomings of a project because how do you differentiate between a seasoned pro and a, and a beginner by just studying um, the lines of code they write? I mean, at least you can't tell 100% of the time. So our research sort of looks at first-time contributors. And, and if you look at our results, our results were rather right-skewed. And some users who were first-time contributors had really massive 100,000 line contributions. So it's clear that in our uh, data set, developers who, are, who have been developing for a while also exist, um, and that's that's a caveat. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Would you, we have other questions on answers? Uh, Vikram, would you please answer the question on the chat? Sure. Yeah. The chat. Yeah. Later. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Vikram. Thank you. Thank you, Ujjajis. We have many questions. Very exciting. Oh, it is the last presentation of this session. Yeah. The last presenter is Ananga um, Papalia, the undergraduate student of Innopolis University. Yeah, the title is Evaluation of Brain Activity While Pair Playing. Very, looked very exciting. Ananda, please. Yeah. Can you guys see the. Yes, I can see and hear you well. Okay, great. <clears throat> so. Let's start. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the ICSC for yesterday's uh, incredible virtual experience and all the judges for the insights, questions and their judgment. And my name is uh, Ananga Thapalia and I'm from Nepal. And went to Russia for undergraduate studies and right now I'm in University of Luxembourg as an exchange student. And the topic of my presentation is evaluation of brain waves while pair programming. And before diving into the objectives, uh, analysis, experiments and all, first let's focus on three keywords. That is the first one is EEZ, uh, which is the electroencephalography device that I use to measure the brain waves of software developers while using um, <clears throat> or solving the problems while doing programming. The second is uh, pair programming and in this technique, one person acts as a driver thinking of the tactical issues and other acts as a navigator concentrating on more strategic architectural concerns. And the last one is waves, uh, the choice of waves. There are different brain waves. And in this case, in this research, I have chosen alpha waves, which is dominant on the quiet flowing thoughts and the theta waves, which is dominant in the deep meditation. And the reason behind the choice of this meditation is the our systematic literature review, which will soon come very soon. So the objective of my research is uh, to find out the effect of pair programming on problem solving and programming activities. 
to find out if pair programming induces the higher uh, concentration or not. And the last one is to find out if pair programming affects the final outcome of the task of the project or not. And at the beginning, uh, talking about the approach and its uniqueness, at the beginning of the research, a systematic literature review was conducted utilizing database search and snowballing strategies uh, to access research and gain evidence on the uh, alternative approaches as well. And the alternative approaches can include fMRI and biometric sensors also. And all the literatures that were involved that I chose for the research purposes involve pair programming, talk about pair programming, and also the talk about the current existing problems and challenges that could occur while performing the actual experiment. And talking about the uniqueness, uh, the uniqueness of the technique uh, lies in pursuing the con new concept by using the complex way of investigating the subject uh, by considering the similarities between the results obtained from two separate analytical methods. And the two separate analytical methods are event-related desynchronization, ERD, and correlation, which we'll talk in a bit. And the uniqueness is because we get the results from these two different analysis methods, compare the results, and indeed uh, it gives a unique approach. Now talking about the experimental methodology and first about the recruitment of the participants. First, we gave a simple notice to the university and whoever volunteers were interested in the research, we gave them the Google form, which consisted of uh, questions related to programming experience and preferred language programming and demography. Of course, there was a consent form which uh, they we used to not breach their data. And the, for, from the results of the Google form, we got to know that Python is the preferred language of programming. And if in any case, the preferred language of programming would be different, it, the results might would differ. But in our case of research, we gave them the free choice and we gave them the option to choose whichever language they are uh, comfortable in while solving the problem. And as for the hardware, we use 24 channel bits uh, and mid star smart BCI easy device. It's just the name of the company. And for the uh, electrodes, it's a 18 one. And this is a standard scheme with the central uh, electrode as the reference. So just want to elaborate. This is the frontal and this is the occipital and this is the central and the CZ lies here, which gives the more, <clears throat> which is the more default and standard scheme. And the electrodes were placed according to the default 1020 scheme. And before the start of the experiment, the device was cleaned with ethyl alcohol. And this is a, one of the standard measures to clean the device just to let the uh, participants be comfortable, which would not alter the results at the end. And during the test uh, setup, during the test setup of the pair programming system, we found that a frontal electrode signal cannot be cleaned with uh, easy pre-processing methods, such as singular component analysis or manual filtering. And because of this, throughout the data collection, I also used a conductive gel to provide a better connection between electrode and the scalp so that it, the result would not be biased just because of the poor connection between the electrodes and the scalp. Now talking about the experiment itself, it consisted of two phases. The first one is calibration phase. And in this phase, the participants would be still, would, would not do anything that is the only uh, would open or close their eyes for two minutes. And the point of the calibration is to quantify the EEG signal so that there would not be direct flow when you go to the actual experiment. And in the actual experiment, pair would be formed and they, they would act as a solo programmer, driver, and the navigator. Also, a very interesting point here yesterday about the uh, collaboration between the pair programmers, uh, compatibility. Uh, if the two pairs are not compatible, they are not good communicators, then would it affect the results at the end? Yes, it would affect the results at the end. This is uh, also from the literature study uh, in one of the Sarah's, uh, as her author, the topic is understanding the mind of developers in pair programming. But how much would it differ by, would it be by less or more? Uh, for that, we have to do the research and the experiment. In this research, we gave the participants to choose the uh, pair themselves so that they would be comfortable while uh, performing the experiment, uh, performing the, solving the problems. Now talking about the analysis,
analytical methods. Uh, one is ERD, event related desynchronization, which is a measure of the degree at which neurons are no longer oscillating in synchronicity as they were enabled to perform the given task. And in simple term, ERD is just a short lasting amplitude enhancement. And another is correlation analysis method, which is uh, just in this, we compare the coefficient of Pearson connection between three sets, that is solo programming, driver and navigator, as I said before. So here now talking about the results, yesterday I could have uh, given only one image, but today I have given all three images, that is from the solo programming, driver and navigator. And in this case, uh, this is obtained from the power spectra analysis. There is an EEZ software itself, which can be used to generate images like this from our uh, collected data. So here we can see in the alpha, uh, we have higher heat map and in others compared to the others, driver and navigator. So at the first glance, we can see that there are differences in the power of the waves between the different situations with higher brain activation in solo compared to the pair programming, that is navigator and the driver. And for the comparison purpose, we can compare each programmer on their own as a single unit, and also average the different programmers and compare the means of different situations with each other. This is, is, this is in only case of the power spectra analysis, which gives the graphic itself uh, from the EEZ software. Now coming for the other analytical methods, the first one is ERD, and for ERD, for pair navigator mode, we obtained higher ERD and equal values for single pair driver mode which implies that role of the navigator needs assessment and guidance of the creation, which in turn requires conceptual attention. Of course, navigator is not engaged in code writing. And as for the correlation, examining examination of pair programming correlation appears in the, uh, to the claims made of the ERD analysis because the brain waves vary from one another while the participants perform mental or any physical action. So the correlation of these waves may vary over time as the theta waves decrease with higher memory load and uh, alpha rings can increase with the higher semantic memory load. So using this information, we can calculate and compare the correlation statistics, which is given in the paper itself as the numbers. And <clears throat> talking about the contribution, it can be concluded that Participants when involved in pair programming were able to complete the task more efficiently, efficiently meaning based on the number of lines of code, complexity, time competition. And uh, this research can also motivate the software developer in industries and in the field of academia to use external factors such as pair programming in their day-to-day -day task. And this can be initiation of research ideas for upcoming researchers to go into the other external factors such as music or without music. So in conclusion, uh, the quite limited data sample is not definitive, of course, but we can see that uh, it offers some observation, not proof of the assertion that the uh, pair programming navigator has a higher degree of attention or concentration based on both uh, ERD and correlation. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you would be more interested, then you can just scan the QR code to read the whole paper and also email me if you want the uh, results from the Google form itself. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Ananga. It looks very interesting. We got a question. Uh, biometrics are a subject to significant variance depending on the individual psychologies. Could you please explain in more detail the sensor calibration phase? Can you repeat? I'll let me see the Q&A itself. Uh, oh, you can see this one? Yeah. Because I cannot, uh, I didn't understand. Uh, yeah, let me read it again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Biometric metrics are subject to significant variance depending on individual psychology. Mm -hmm. so could you please explain in more detail the sensor calibration phase? In more detail what? Sense of calibration phase. Ah, okay. Ah, so in the calibration phase, yeah. <clears throat> in the calibration phase, yeah, it, it depends on the biometric sensors, of course. For example, there are other biometric sensors such as eye tracking, and even in the case of fMRI, the calibration phase could be different. But in the EEZ, why are we using the calibration phase as the closing the eyes or opening the eyes for two minutes and sitting still? Because of the EEZ has poor signal to noise ratio 
because of that it can uh, it can directly uh, get the muscle activity in the brain and can cause the uh, the waves to get altered that is the waves to get uh, more noisier so because of the calibration phase it does quantify the eeg signals and while it's not a direct flow to directly to, to the actual experiment uh, this is why the calibration phase we have to do it in this manner in the case of eeg okay thanks and other questions oh yeah mm, yeah yeah this another one yeah 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 okay thanks adam kar i have some question to ask you but it is time to wrap up this session so i will okay. ask you later thank you adam kar uh, yes thank you yes Thank you, all contestants and judges. Yeah. Yes, thank you, all contestants and judges. It was very interesting and exciting session. Yeah, I think so, yeah. this is all we prepared for this session. And thank you very much yeah, for your attending, judging, and presenting too. Thank you, and enjoy the uh, session rest. Thank you very much. Bye bye. And judges, please send your scores to me and Andy. After you finishing your scoring. Thank you very much, Judge too. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm the only one who can applaud you. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you, Anangar. Yeah, I'm just you did great thing, I think. Or, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Sashi, Zabello. Yeah, you did well. Thank you. I see you. Audience and judges, thank you for coming and attending, listening, asking questions in this session. I appreciate it. I hope you have a good day. Yeah, it is 7 p.m. in Korea, Seoul, Korea. Uh, it is bright outside still. Yeah, I hope you will come to Korea later. Yeah. Uh, Seoul, Korea is safe. Yeah, from a little bit yeah, coronavirus. Yes, very beautiful. Yes, you're right. Yeah, thank you, anybody. I'm gonna uh, shut down this webinar sessions. I hope to see you soon in anywhere in the conference room, virtually, of course. Okay, goodbye.